Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Wayne Motts, and it's my honor to be the chief, uh, the chief executive officer here at the National Civil War Museum. Welcome to the museum on this Saturday afternoon for our Lectures in History series, uh, number three out of 12 uh, for the year here. And I just want to point out a couple things. First of all, our sponsors that are listed over here on the right. We have these programs because folks have taken interest uh, to support the museum. Corporate sponsors, individuals by membership, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and so we're able to present these programs because people have come forth with dollars to allow us uh, to do that. So we want to thank them uh, so very much for the continuing education of folks related to the American Civil War. It's what we do here at the National Civil War Museum. I'm really proud of the diverse uh, offerings of programs that we have here. And uh, today is going to be an interesting presentation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our speaker. Tom McMillan, I've known Tom for many, many years, is the Vice President of Communications for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Now, I saw some people with penguins. Uh, there we are, right up front. They did that just for you, Tom. Uh, right up front here. Tom, for several decades, has been affiliated with the Penguins. He has a very important position. But what a lot of people don't know about him is his interest related to history. He is a board member of the Heinz History Center. He is on the marketing committee at the Gettysburg uh, Foundation. And he's put together a couple books. He has a book on Flight 93 out in Somerset, Pennsylvania. Tom Ridge wrote the foreword to this book. It's probably the definitive history on Flight 93. So Tom has a variety of interests. What he's going to talk to you today about is his Civil War interest, but he's very knowledgeable about many topics and many things. The book he's going to speak to you about today is Gettysburg Rebels, Five Native Sons Who Came Home to Fight as Confederate Soldiers in the Battle of Gettysburg. Oh, wow. And yes, afterwards, you too can own this book, ladies and gentlemen. To <laughs> <laughs> have Tom sign your own personal copy over in the gift shop. So we'll take questions after his presentation, then we're going to rush them over to the gift shop, and there are copies of Gettysburg Rebels available for you to purchase over there. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Tom McMillan. Tom, thanks. <laughs> Thanks for having me. A game last night, game tomorrow afternoon. It's nice to have this little respite in the middle. So I, I, I appreciate that. And it's good to be back in my hometown. I was born in Harrisburg. They took down the home of sign when they found out I was only I only lived here for six months. So, uh, Sixty and a half years in Pittsburgh, six months here in, in Harrisburg. But uh, uh, it is good to be back. And thank you to, to Wayne and Wayne and his staff do a do a great job here. Um, and as Wayne mentioned, I had. Uh, a couple of years ago, I've written a book about Flight 93, a very emotional book for me, uh, the September 11th flight that crashed in Somerset County. My friends who knew I was a sports guy weren't surprised that I wrote a book on history. They were surprised that it wasn't on Gettysburg. I got to write it on Because I, as Wayne said, I've been going up there for 25 years. Uh, my wife and I got married uh, on the battlefield, which you're not allowed to do, so don't tell them. <laughs> we actually have we actually have a plot in Evergreen Cemetery. That's as about as committed as you can as you, as you can get. But I, I said I, I needed a fresh topic. I wasn't one of those people who would have written the tenth version of John Buford's cavalry operations on the first day. I would, I would read that book, but I needed a kind of research challenge. And little did I realize that there was a topic that had been staring me in the face all these years. Uh, I think most of you have been to Gettysburg. If you Go down the Emmitsburg Road, past the field of Pickett's Charge, and you get to the intersection with the Wheatfield Road. Uh, I forgot one thing. There I am with the Stanley Cup from the 62nd field. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, I had eight descendants who bought the 62nd Pennsylvania in the Wheatfield, so they sure I took the Stanley Cup there, and that's another that. <laughs> forgot about that. Got to hit my own story. Um, but if you go down the, uh, this is really, if you go down the Emmitsburg Road at the intersection with the Wheatfield Road, there is a mundane iron tablet that says simply Wentz House. And there is nothing there which confounds people, because if you see Kudori House, there's a house. The Sharpie House, there's a house. The Wentz House, that's what you see. So no one goes there, especially because right across the road is one of the most visited parts of the battlefield, <coughs> the Peach Orchard. So really, very few people get to this side of it. It looks like nothing's there, but if you look very closely in the background, there is a uh, rectangular stone foundation. And in July 1863, this was the home of John Wentz, his wife Mary, and his youngest adult daughter, Susan. Uh, John had purchased this property in 1836. He came over from New York County. A family was much larger then 
uh, with many more young children, and he had, including a, a nine-year-old son in 1836 named Henry. Grew up on this land, obviously hunted and fished, and knew the streams and the trails and the hills and the landscape. If you go 600 yards to the west, almost directly to the west, there's another iron tablet, the kind the War Department put up around the turn of the century, to mark troop positions. This is Taylor's Battery, Taylor's Virginia Battery, Army of Northern Virginia. And this on the afternoon of July 2nd, 1863, was the position of Confederate Artillery Sergeant Henry Wentz. Not only 600 yards from the house where he grew up, marked by those two little trees out there, but from where his parents still lived, and where unbeknownst to him, his father had determined to ride out the battle in the cellar. So Henry's on this side with the guns, John's on that side in the cellar surrounded by the 2nd New Hampshire Infantry. It's pretty, pretty surreal when you think about it. There was one other man I knew about, and, and most Gettysburg buffs know the name Wesley Culp, who had fought for the Confederate Army. Uh, mostly his connection with the famous Culp family of Gettysburg, Culp Farm, Culp's Hill. Uh, 1860 Gettysburg census, there are 70 people named Culp in that small borough, so it's quite a prolific family. Uh, Wesley had gone south in the 1850s for work. He joined the Confederate Army. He was in the 2nd Virginia. He fought in the Battle of Gettysburg and was killed in the Battle of Gettysburg. And as the legend and myth goes, he was killed on July 3rd on Culp's Hill on a farm owned by his uncle, which kind of tugs at the visitor's heartstrings. It was maybe a little too nice and neat for me, so you look into it, I find the only thing that's true about that story is that Wesley was killed there. I pr propose to show in the book he was killed on July 2nd, not July 3rd. He was killed on or near Wolf Hill, not Culp's Hill. And, uh, and the, the man who owned the farm was a, wasn't his uncle, was a much more distant relative. Who knows it? Who knows who even knew him very well or not? Uh, so legends are great to teach history, but sometimes the truth is interesting as well. And I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> uh, that was more interesting to me. So I, I, I was talking to my book agent, kicking around a couple of ideas, and I had some other ones, and he said, no, I. You're a Gettysburg guy. You should finally write a Gettysburg book. Is there enough? And I said, I really didn't know. I had to start doing some research. And to the extent that it's written about Wesley Culp going south, he went with his uh, employer, a carriage maker named Charles William Hoffman, C.W. Hoffman. So obviously I had to research him. You look in the 1850 Gettysburg census, and he has three young sons, who if you add 10 or 11 years to their age, would by the time of the Civil War be of age to be Civil War soldiers. Go to the National Archives, and sure enough, Robert Frank and Wesley Hoffman, all born in Gettysburg, all raised on the second block of Chambersburg Street, not only were in the Confederate Army, but were in units that came north with Robert E. Lee in that great invasion of the summer of 1863. So these are the men I call the Gettysburg Rebels, Henry Wentz and Taylor's Battery, Wesley Culp, 2nd Virginia Company B, Robert Hoffman, 2nd Virginia Company B, Frank Hoffman, 38th Battalion, Virginia Light Artillery, and Wesley Hoffman, the 7th Virginia Cavalry Company A. They had all three branches of the service. So I, I really do think, I think Wayne will agree with me, history is best taught with human interest stories. It's not just names and dates. I can't imagine a more compelling interest, human interest story in any war of five young men coming home to their old hometown as foreign invaders. Mm -hmm. But when it's the Civil War, which means so much to our history, and when it's the Battle of Gettysburg, the most famous battle, I thought it was even more, more compelling. So I wanted to look into it. One of the things that struck me early in the research was that there's no evidence that Robert E. Lee or any of his senior commanders had any idea they had five guys from Gettysburg in their army, which is really a stunning lack of communication and a failure of intelligence. It was commonplace, if you study the Civil War in the Confederate Army, when they were on campaign, and they were near a town of Richmond or Fredericksburg, and there, were, there was a local <coughs> man in the ranks, they would pull him out of the ranks and temporarily attach him to staff as a scout or a guide. It made sense. James Longstreet did it, Stonewall Jackson did it, Jackson had a guy at Chancellorsville that was said to know every hog path. It's how he pulled off the flank march. It's how he knew where he was going. This stuff makes sense. Mm -hmm. These guys didn't know. And it's more impactful here because we know that at least on two occasions on the second day, the Confederate Army either got lost or confused by terrain here in Northern Territory. Early that morning, Robert E. Lee sends out his topographical engineer, Samuel Johnston, to reconnoiter the Union left. As the story goes, Johnston comes back a few hours later, says he's made it to Little Round Top, and there were no Union troops in the vicinity. Lee, therefore, bases his entire battle plan on faulty and flawed intelligence, because there were Union troops everywhere. He didn't get to Little Round Top. We don't know where he got. He didn't get to Little Round Top. These guys obviously weren't great soldiers. Four of them never rose above the rank of private. One made it all the way to sergeant. But whatever else they couldn't, could have or could not have done on the battlefield, they wouldn't have gotten lost. So 
what's an interesting little impact here. Now, later that same afternoon, uh, as James Longstreet is maneuvering his two divisions into position to execute the plan based on this flawed intelligence, uh, he is told, they are told to conceal themselves from Union signalmen who are now on Little Round Top. Sure enough, he goes over a ball and rise a couple of miles from the battlefield. He can see the signalmen, means the signalmen can see them. They hurled many invectives, as you can imagine, and the turnaround cost them several miles and several hours. So the battle on the second starts later than it was supposed to. And yet, there was one Confederate unit just before that that got, in, got into position without countermarching. It was an artillery unit with 26 guns under E.P. Alexander. Oh, wow. But they, he, Alexander writes, they zigzagged through the fields, found the old farmland, came down and got into position and waited for several hours for the infantry. Is it any coincidence that the one unit that got there had in this ranks a man from Gettysburg named Henry Wentz? Henry Wentz wrote nothing about his Civil War experiences, or if he did nothing, his survived. He had never married, no children, no direct descendants. Uh, Alexander, as you know, wrote voluminously. He wrote all the time. Uh, never mentioned it. Uh, he was a trained engineer. He could have done this on his own. I just, it's too much of a coincidence to me. I, 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 just, I can't believe that, that the one unit that got there uh, was, had a man from Gettysburg in the audience, and he, in, the, in the ranks, and he wasn't uh, the reason that they got there. So I always believe that Henry Wentz had a reason uh, for being there, for them being there. Now, uh, as, as you're, you're starting to research this, um, I get into, uh, to check into the Hoffman family, because we know Wesley, Hall, Wesley Culp went south with the Hoffmans, and I do mention uh, those three brothers. You, you find those in the ranks. I, I to tell people, like, why didn't, why didn't anybody else do this story beforehand? Why didn't anybody look at this? Well, first of all, no one knew about the Hoffmans. Robert Hoffman, in 150 years after the Civil War, was mentioned once in several sentences in Bill Frasenito's book on early photography. Frank Hoffman was mentioned once in a sidebar in Wayne Watts's book on Pickett's Charge. I was so mad at Wayne when I found out that he, I thought I discovered Frank Hoffman. <laughs> Nobody had mentioned Wesley Hoffman. In all my years of going to Gettysburg, it's the one thing that I knew that Wayne Watts didn't know. <laughs> that Wesley Hoffman was in those ranks. But the, the other challenge here, folks, was these guys didn't leave the kind of uh, background material that we're used, usually used to reading about in books, letters, and other materials. Most books, when you think of it, are written about, if they're in, about individuals that are about generals or battlefield heroes. Or, people won medals of honor, and, and their families were very proud and kept all these documents. These guys were just kind of regular schmucks, and their family didn't say anything. Nothing, nothing has, ex has existed, uh, has, has been passed on. So it was really a mysterious research project that my wife and I undertook. It's amazing what you can find in these little county courthouses in Virginia and West Virginia. Um, deed records, church records, tax records, old newspaper accounts, uh, newspaper advertisements. You think if you had a business back then, you had to advertise it in the newspaper. So you can follow someone's business career through those advertisements. I was also very fortunate to, uh, to uh, uncover two uh, unpublished family histories that had never been cited by historians before. One written by Robert Hoffman's daughter, another written by Wesley Culp's niece. So those were very key pieces of this. Now, photographs. This is Wesley Culp. That photo has been published many, many times before, obviously taken in 1861 or 1862. Got that from the Gettysburg National Military Park. Now, when you're starting a project like this and you haven't written anything about Gettysburg before, you talk to some experts. So I actually came up here to Harrisburg and met with Wayne. The first to say, Wayne, am I nuts for trying to write about this topic? And he encouraged me. One thing he did say was, I think they're anonymous guys. You really need to try to find some photos of these guys. It really adds to the book. So. I looked really hard to hear the photos of the other guys. <laughs> I, I wasn't dissing Wayne, I tried really hard. Sometimes they're, they aren't out there. I talked to at least nine Hoffman family descendants. Uh, they didn't have them, they were hoping that I would find them. Sometimes this just doesn't happen. Uh, again, people don't save these things. I wrote in the book and I hope that someday a Hoffman descendant will read the book and go into their attic of their cellar and look at a in a box and say, that's Robert Hoffman, but that, that hasn't happened yet, so uh, I, uh, I had to move forward without those. So I apologize, Wayne, I tried to take your advice, but uh, maybe we'll come up with... Uh, you can always these. do what you can do, Tom. <laughs> 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 exactly.
exactly. So go ahead. We will start the, kind of the story in general with Wesley Culp. He's the most known of these guys. He was born in, uh, in 1839 in Adams County, not in Gettysburg. Uh, he was born in a little town 14 miles away called Petersburg, now York Springs. Uh, but his family obviously had deep Gettysburg roots. His uh, great-grandfather bought the original farm in Culp's Hill uh, right after the Revolutionary War. He got it from Samuel Geddes, who got it from William Penn. So this goes back to the very beginnings of, uh, of, of the Commonwealth. Uh, his father, Esaias Culp, uh, born and raised in Gettysburg, opened his tailoring business in Gettysburg, started his family in Gettysburg. Wesley's older siblings actually were born in Gettysburg, but in the 1830s, for whatever reason, Esaias moved his family uh, to Petersburg, and that's where Wesley spent, spent the first eight years of his life. We do uh, know that he, they were back in Gettysburg by 1847, all because of this newspaper advertisement, and you can learn a lot. There it is, Esaias J. Culp, he has moved his tailoring shop to Gettysburg. The tax records back this up, and by the 1850s, sure enough, the entire Culp family uh, is in the census there in Gettysburg. So Wesley lived in Gettysburg uh, from 1847 to 1856, from the time he was about eight to the time he was about 17. Why did he leave? He went south for work. We have to look into his, his employer to see why that happened. Charles William Hoffman, C.W. Hoffman, carriage maker. Uh, we're doing the research. Uh, my wife said, I think this guy's the key to the story. Said, no, 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 this guy's just a tangential figure. <laughs> Who was right? <laughs> it's a very good part of the story. Um, he, he's, the, the thing he's written about it is that he's a carriage maker. Uh, Bill Frazzanito calls him a, a, a prominent carriage maker, which was true. Um, this is an ad uh, in, from the 1830s. Just moved his uh, his his uh, carriage shop, and so you can see C. W. Hoffman. If you want to know where that place is today, there is a small sign that not many people have ever seen. It's on Chambersburg Street between 117 and 119. C. W. Hoffman House, the last building of his complex. There's some incorrect information there on Wesley Culp. Hopefully, not the books out. They will change that. But uh, a lot of number of my Gettysburg friends who've been there for years have never seen that sign. It's right across from the Gary Owen Tavern. If you've been there, so just you know, a little little piece of uh, C.W. Hoffman history. But carriage maker, he was that. But what I found was he was one of the most prominent citizens of Gettysburg in the 1840s and 1850s. He was right up there with the names you've heard, the Fonstocks and the Jewelers and the Sheets and the McConaughey's. He's whitewashed from history because he went south. But consider this. He owned multiple businesses. He owned at least 10 pieces of property. He was elected three times to Gettysburg Borough Council. He was a trustee of the Methodist Episcopal Church. He, was, he represented Gettysburg at the State Temperance Convention, which meant that he was one of the leading teetotalers in town. And I think there was a lot of arguments about that. And he was also part of a group of small, a small group of citizens that created and founded a new cemetery in the 1850s. Two words, Evergreen Cemetery, which is why we have the battlefield landmark called Cemetery Hill, and obviously that's where uh, Abraham Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address. So why did this guy leave? We know that by March 1856, he's in Shepherdstown. Then Virginia, now West Virginia. But in 1854, he, he ran for and was elected to a three-year term on Gettysburg Borough Council. And he just opened a new steam mill, which was going to be the crown jewel of his business operation. These aren't the signs of someone who's about to leave. They're digging down deeper roots. So what happened? Couldn't figure it out. No one knows this story. To the extent I talked to people in Gettysburg, they said, well, you know, the carriage makers did a lot of business in, in Virginia. He was probably just going where the business was. It, I probably would have written that until one day I was at the Adams County Historical Society, where Wayne used to work, a great little place, and I was paging through uh, Methodist church records. If you ever have insomnia, just go to the Historical Society and page through Methodist church records in the 1850s. <laughs> but I, st I stayed awake long enough to find this little treasure trove. I'll read it from here. I can read it over here. On Monday, the 26th day of June last, said C.W. Hoffman imprudently and unnecessarily engaged with one John Barrett in a cruel fight by striking with a stick or club, throwing stones and striking with iron. Hoffman using the stick and stones and Barrett using the iron with the intention of doing severe bodily harm. So we needed to know that. Uh, all of which showed highly improper conduct and sinful tempers and actions on the part of said C.W. Hoffman and shamefully outraged the cause of God. The city borough councilman and church trustee beat the crap out of something. <laughs> and he was immediately disciplined by his church, humiliated, no doubt. 
By early 1855, he's removed from borough council, and also by early 1855, he's starting to place ads that he's going to rent or sell his property within a year. And sure enough, in March of 1856, uh, they move south to Shepherdstown, 50 miles south to Shepherdstown. And with him go four future Confederate soldiers, his three sons in Wesley Hall. And one of the first things that the older boys do when they get to Shepherdstown is to join a militia unit, Wesley Culp and Robert Hoffman. They're 16, 17. Very commonplace, mid-19th century, you get to carry a gun, wear a uniform, do drills like you're in the Army. Also a great social outlet at that time to meet new friends, especially you have newcomers to town. And for these guys, even though it was only 50 miles, they moved from the north to the south. So it was a way to show some loyalty to their new town. We're going to defend Shepherdstown with our, with our friends. Now, 10 miles away in Martinsburg, the same thing had happened. Uh, we'll bring Henry Wentz back into the story. He's 12 or 15 years older than these guys. He goes to Virginia, Martinsburg, uh, a little bit earlier in 1852. First thing he does is join a militia unit in Martinsburg, the Martinsburg Independent Blues. And bring that up not just because it, it, as students of the Civil War, we know that these militia units became the foundation of both armies. They often enlisted in mass and became, and became companies. But for at least two of these guys, this was their initiation to combat. Uh, because of uh, something else that happened in a nearby town in 1859, <coughs> two years before the Civil War. The John Brown Raid in Harper's Ferry. Harper's Ferry, Shepherdstown, Martinsburg, all in the same little area. John Brown, the wide-eyed abolitionist, he has this plan where he's going to take his army of 20 men, they're going to sneak into Harper's Ferry, they're going to seize the army and arsenal, they're going to free some slaves, arm the slaves, create a slave insurrection, and forever end the scourge of slavery in America. Sure enough, they did get into town. They did take the army and arsenal. They did free some slaves. They did take some prisoners. They killed a few men, created an absolute panic. Messages go out to nearby towns to send your militia units. Two of them came from Shepherdstown and Martinsburg, and there's direct and circumstantial evidence. Both Henry Wentz and Robert Hoffman answered the call and, and came here for the John Brown Raid. Now, it also got the attention of President Buchanan down in Washington. He sent a detachment of 90 US Marines they were under the temporary command of a U.S. Army colonel who happened to be home in the D.C. area visiting family. So they came north under the command of U.S. Army Colonel Robert E. Lee, whose second in command was U.S. Army Lieutenant James Joel Brown Stewart. So uh, absurd as it sounds, Robert E. Lee and Jeb Stewart, two years before the Civil War, led the U.S. troops up here. They easily put down the John Brown raid. They captured Brown. He was uh, tried and convicted, hanged in December of that year. But I think it, it showed that these guys just didn't move anywhere in the South. They moved to a little area where the Civil War was boiling two years before the war broke out. It, it, it had to impact them. And, and yet, you know, we tend to think it affected every part of their lives. It, it didn't. The two letters that I was able to obtain that Wesley Culp wrote during his life came in the summer of 1860. He wrote them home to his sisters in Gettysburg. Uh, I was able to obtain them from a descendant. That's the first time anybody in the book, anybody's seen his uh, signature, John Wesley Culp, J. Wesley Culp. The only thing remarkable about these letters, other than they exist, is that Wesley was a horrible speller. He spelled phonetically. I, I, I put the book, uh, the letter verbatim in the book. It takes a while to get through it. You can figure it out, but uh, I just thought it was an interesting piece of history to do that. Normal letter, what you would speak to about your sisters, and he talks about his goal in life at this point, summer of 1860, is he wants to go to the West and seek his fortune. And obviously, nine months later, uh, the Confederates fire on Fort Sumter on April 12th, and the dreams and visions of Wesley and hundreds of thousands of other young men in the country were changed forever. Three of these guys that we're talking about were ready to go right away. Within two weeks, they're in the Confederate Army. Robert Hoffman, Henry Wentz, Wesley Culp, April 18th, 19th, and 20th, they enlist. Uh, Robert and Wesley are sent with their militia unit to Harper's Ferry. They become Company B of the 2nd Virginia. Their first commander is an eccentric commander from VMI named Thomas Jonathan Jackson. It was before he got the nickname Stonewall, and this was the beginning of the famed Stonewall Brigade, and Wesley and Robert served under Jackson in some capacity for the remainder of his life at the building Chancellorsville in 1863. Now, the same thing also was going on in the North. Abraham Lincoln had put out a call for men, militia units, come forward, protect the Union, save the Union. Uh, in, in Gettysburg, men came out. Uh, on April 20th, the same day that Wesley Culp enlisted in the Confederate Army, his brother William Culp enlisted in the Union Army. Big ceremony in the town square in Gettysburg. They became uh, <coughs> Company E of the 2nd Pennsylvania, a three-month regiment. 
Wesley Culp, or Win William Culp, several of his cousins, and Wesley's good boyhood friend, Jack Skelly. Now, interestingly, those two units, the 2nd PA and the 2nd Virginia, almost met very early in the Civil War, before First Manassas. There was a little skirmish, almost, in a little town called Fallen Waters. Union had more troops there. Jackson had to pull his, his troops out very quickly. The second Pennsylvania was rushing in. They got there too late, so they didn't see the fighting. But a couple of days later, Jack Skelly writes a letter home to his mother with the bravado of a guy who's never been in battle. They wouldn't stand and fight. We would have given them what they deserved. But he also wrote, Wes Culp was along with them. He was seen by the people of Martinsburg when they went through. And this is the first indication to anyone in Gettysburg other than his sisters that Wesley Culp was fighting for the Confederate Army against the United States. And they weren't very happy about it. I try to follow these guys for the first two years of the war through their, a lot of their, their militia records, their unit records, their uh, any kind of evidence that we have here. Try to pick out some personalities, of, not just just as the battles, some personality traits. Robert Hoffman won AWOL four times in the first year and a half of the war. All four times he was let back into the army with little or no punishment. So I'm trying to figure out <coughs> what's happening. A book like this, you kind of have to come up with theories, but you have to be able to back them up. I think it's because, going back to his father, C.W. Hoffman, that Shepherdstown carriage maker thing didn't work out too well. He goes there in 1856. By 1859, he moves 50 miles south to Fauquier County, Virginia. He buys a 500-acre farm. He's not going to become a farmer, but also do business from that farm. I found 25 receipts of C.W. Hoffman doing business with the Confederate Army. In the deed record for that farm, listed among the implements of the shovels and the wheelbarrows and everything else are three human beings listed right there in the deed record. You know about it. You're reading the deed record. It's really, it, it really hits you. So he became a slave owner. He's clearly supporting the, the Confederate cause, selling uh, information or selling items to the Confederate Army, horses, cattle, grain, blacksmithing services, you name it. So I believe that Robert was coming home to check on the safety of his parents and his young wife, but he was also helping his father deliver these supplies. I think that must have been why they, they let him back in the army so many, or led him back so many times without, without punishment. Wesley Culp, he was one of those guys, if you study him, stuff, you know, we all know people, stuff just happened to him. Spring and early summer of 1862, he is captured not once but twice within three months. Uh, it's not clear in his military records because they're only taken every 60 days. He pieced it together otherwise. But he was taken prisoner after the Battle of Kernstown. Uh, he was then released and signed an oath of allegiance. He writes about it to his sister back in Gettysburg, Ann Colt Myers, who lives on West Middle Street. She happens to live across the street from the Skelly family. One of her best friends is Elizabeth Skelly. So you have one lady whose brother's in the Confederate Army and one lady whose son is in the Union Army. This is what the war did to our country. Wow. Shortly after that, Elizabeth writes a letter to Jack. Did you know Wes Colt was taken prisoner at Winchester but is released on parole? He wrote to Anne, God only knew what he suffered while he was a prisoner. Do you all pity him? Anne tries to excite sympathy. Do you all pity him? This is the middle of a war. But that's what the mother wrote to her son. So Wesley gets, he's obviously out of prison rejoins his unit. He's captured again in Lake May. He's taken to a Union prison in Baltimore, probably Fort McHenry. At this point, the Gettysburg men, they're now in the 87th Pennsylvania, a more permanent regiment. They're stationed near Baltimore. William Culp hears that his brother is a prisoner. He gets a pass to go visit Wesley in prison. The Union brother visits the Confederate brother in prison. He writes about it in a letter to Anne back in Gettysburg. She must be thinking, what is going on? She's getting all these crazy letters. I've been a permit from the provost marshal yesterday to visit Wesley. I was with him about two hours and a half. He told me to tell you not to be uneasy about him because he is well and will soon get out. I will try to see him as often as I can, but it's hard to get a permit to see anyone in the jail. Can you read this? This is, this is amazing stuff of what the war did to people and what it did to families. Now, shortly after that, there's another person taken prisoner. The old man, C.W. Hoffman. The Union armies had just about enough of him selling stuff to the Confederates. They go into his farm, they arrest him, they take him to Washington, D.C. This is reported in the Gettysburg Papers, one paragraph on top of the other, sequentially. I have some clearer copies, but here's the original one. C.W. Hoffman, right above Wesley Culp. 
The journalist didn't make the connection between the two, but there they are. Here they are. We learned that C.W. Hoffman, coachmaker, formerly of this place, has been in the Rebel Army for some time with his three, three sons. He obviously wasn't in the Army, but he was supporting. He was captured a few days ago near Linden, Virginia, by General Geary's command, is now in prison in Washington. How much better to have joined his fortunes with the Union men than send down his name to his posterity as a traitor. In the same edition, our young townsman Wesley Colt was taken prisoner at the Battle of Winchester, took the oath of allegiance to the United States, was released, then joined a band of guerrillas and has been captured again. He is good and right for summary process, or at least ought to be. Partisan journalism did not begin the 21st century, folks. <laughs> right there in Gettysburg in 19th century, these people weren't very happy. These guys were not in prison for long. CW is back on his farm by late July. How do we know that? More receipts. He didn't repent. He's back selling stuff to the Confederate Army. Wesley, though, from his military records, has released a massive prison exchange on August 5th and rejoins his unit. To move forward now to June of 1863, Robert E. Lee is bringing his massive force. They're going to come and invade the North. This is the first time that all five of these Gettysburg rebels are together. Frank Hoffman, the artillery, Wesley Hoffman, the cavalry have joined, they're moving north. They, of course, don't know they're coming to Gettysburg. They're going to fight a battle somewhere, but they don't know where that's going to be. They have assignments coming north, and one of the assignments for the Second Corps was to clear out a garrison, Union garrison at Winchester, Virginia, but when part of the responsibility fell to the Stonewall Brigade. On the final day, in the dark, the Union's trying to escape. The Stonewall Brigade falls on uh, those retreating Union forces, and this is where we have actual brother versus brother. The Second Virginia against the 87th Pennsylvania, Wesley Culp against William Culp. You hear that in the Civil War all the time, they fought against each other. Uh, it was a bad day for the 87th Pennsylvania and the Union troops. The Stonewall Brigade took six battle flags, including the 87th PA. They took 200 prisoners from the 87th alone. One of them was not William Culp. He slithered away, was able to walk back to Gettysburg with a couple of his comrades. There are, there are accounts in town of those guys were getting back to Gettysburg a few days later. But the rest of the prisoners were marched through uh, Winchester, and Wesley Culp sees a familiar face. His cousin, Billy Holtzworth, who later went on to become one of the, the famous early battlefield guys. Uh, Billy, prisoner, are you? Anything I can do for you? No, Wes, but Jack Skelly's back at the end of the woods, and he's wounded. You can do something for him. So Wes chases down, and goes out there, hunts down his uh, boyhood friend. He has him taken to a hospital. They have a conversation. This is part of the Jenny Wade legend myth story. They have uh, Jack Skelly was uh, involved with Jenny Wade. But the story as it's told now is Jack gave Wesley a message for Jenny Wade. When it was first reported at the turn of the century, the message was for his mother. Who knows what's true or we, we don't know. Well, it was a message. They had a conversation last time they ever see each other. Uh, and the Confederate Army continues north. Now, another thing that happens during this battle, Robert Hoffman, who obviously has gone AWOL four times, wasn't the best infantryman, he's been put in the commissary department. In the middle of, the, of the, the, uh, this battle at Winchester, he is assigned, it's right there on his uh, service record, to drive cattle. To look at it, smart. Do some research, though. Obviously, one of the reasons Lee came north was to get supplies. They got a lot of cattle. They got tens of thousands of head of cattle. Uh, men needed to drive them. Half of them were sent back to their supply lines in Virginia. Half went north with the army. They were driven with the army to feed the troops. So how do we know that Robert didn't go south? How did we know he came north with the army? Because of this receipt that he signed near Carlisle, PA, on June 30th. There he is, Edward Johnson for the use of the Stonewall Brigade. We know he came north. That's why I think when I go back to the point of uh, one of these men who could have been used as a scout or a guide, this guy would have been perfect. He wasn't in a key infantry position. He lived in Gettysburg for 16 years. Apparently, somehow, it never got up the ranks. That, Army. Did that affect the battle? Who knows? But it's just its just one of the things that happens in war. I just was rather amazed that it never got up to the ranks that they didn't know that five guys from Gettysburg were here. Now, uh, none of these guys were here for the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg. The first unit to make it in is Wesley Culp's unit, 2nd Virginia, Stonewall Brigade. They come in on the evening of the first at dusk. They come down Carlisle Street and make a left through the town square. How do we know that? Because one of Wesley's friends from Shepherdstown in that unit, 50 years later on the 50 year anniversary, uh, does an interview with the Pittsburgh newspaper, Benjamin Pendleton. We came in on the Carlisle Road and the head of the column turned left at the square. There were few citizens of the town to be seen for there had been much fighting in the streets before we arrived. The townspeople made themselves scarce so that no one welcomed or recognized 
Wes Colt on his homecoming. These guys were posted up along the Hanover Road. Stonewall Brigade is actually on the Daniel Lady Farm, which is a mark, uh, battlefield landmark today. Up there. Some of them went to bed, some of them went out skirmishing. Not Wes. He gets a pass to go into town to visit his sisters. Benjamin Pendleton was on uh, the staff of Brigade General, uh, Brigadier, Brigadier General James Walker, gets Wes a pass. So Walker knows Wes is from Gettysburg, doesn't tell anybody. <laughs> imagine this scene. The Confederates held the town, but imagine walking the dark into town. There's still Gettysburg citizens who aren't real happy with you. Somebody might take a pot shot. And imagine the sisters. In the dark, there's a knock at the door. They look outside, there's Confederate uniform. They open the door, it's their brother. They haven't seen him for two years. There's hugging, shrieking, kissing. They catch up. Uh, Wes tells them about Billy Holtzworth. He tells me his message from Mrs. Skelly. The sisters admonish him for shooting at his brother two, month, two weeks earlier. They had heard that story. They ask him to stay. Obviously, it's the middle of the war. He can't stay. He goes back. His sister Ann says, Wes, please, please stay. We might never see you again. Off he goes. Two nights later, the night of July 3rd, after Cookett's charge, in the dark, the Confederates still hold the town. They haven't retreated yet. There's another knock at that door. Benjamin Pendleton. He knows the Culp sisters from their many trips to Shepherdstown to visit Wesley. He's there to tell them that Wesley has been killed. He describes specifically that he was killed on the morning of the second while he was skirmishing. Uh, this is in the that unpublished family history that I got that was written by Ann Culp Myers' daughter. Now the daughter wasn't alive at the time, but she heard this directly from her mother. It's the first, it's the closest we can get to direct evidence. Uh, she mentioned it three times in her history that he was killed on the morning of the second skirmish. So I have to check as a historian, you know, Wayne, you still have to check that out. Did the second Virginia <coughs> skirmish that morning? Yes, they did. It's in the reports of both the, the division, brigade, and regimental commanders. It's also in the reports of the 27th Indiana and the 9th Massachusetts. The 9th talks about skirmishing with the second Virginia on the Deardorf farm. The war area Deardorf house still stands in Gettysburg, 75 Montclair Road. It was just, it was just sold, actually. I've been out there a lot. Uh, the old farm is bisected by modern, uh, modern day Route 15. It's near Wolf Hill. So I believe that that's as close as we can tell as to where Wesley Culp was shot. You want to go where he was shot? That, that's where it was. Now, Benjamin Pendleton told the sisters, I know where he was buried. He described it. Never found the body. Why? He told them Culp's Hill. He was a Virginian. He didn't know the geography of Gettysburg. Culp's Hill is famous, so the sisters go to the wrong place. They never find the body. They do find his gun stock, W. Culp. People say, okay, big shot, how'd this happen? Wesley was the only man from his unit killed during the Battle of Gettysburg. With the lack of munitions and other equipment they had, the Confederate Army is not allowing a functioning musket to lay on the ground. So I believe that somebody picked up that musket, and they were around Culp's Hill on the 3rd. When the man was killed, whatever happened, I don't know. But that's, I think that's why they found, found the gun stock there, but not the body. What happened to his body, we don't know. Uh, the family refutes uh, any rumors that it was found and secretly buried somewhere. There is a stone for Wesley Culp in the Hollywood, uh, Gettysburg section of the Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond. Wesley Culp, 2nd Virginia, but there's believed to be ceremonial. There's no record that he was... He was buried there. Uh, some people still think he might have been buried in Evergreen Cemetery, in Gettysburg. Uh, my plot is two rows in front of the Culp Family Cemetery. Is the plot? It was close there. I always thought, wouldn't it be cool if after I, because they're digging to put me in the ground and they find Wesley Culp. <laughs> <laughs> so if that happens, I won't be around, but you got somebody calling and put that in the obituary. That would be, that's, that's great research. That's great research. <laughs> That ends the Wesley Culp story, not the Gettysburg Rebels, obviously. July 2nd, that afternoon, Henry Wentz is in action, again, 600 yards from his house, firing toward his house, not knowing his father is in there. The Confederates make some gains, as we know, early that, early that day. The infantry blows sickles off that salient. E.P. Alexander limbers up his batteries. He talks about one of the most inspiring moments of the war, being that charge of those batteries. Henry Wentz, folks, is not just charging toward his house. He's actually ch charging over a piece of land that he personally owns. There's a nine-acre plot, diagonal, right across from the, from the Wentz house, uh, that you know, the deed records show that his father, John Wentz, bought it in 1847. Deed records also show he transferred ownership to Henry in 1850. It's not sold until 1872. 
over land that he owns. If you go up to the Long Street Tower, you can go to see where this is. Uh, past his house, he ends up 150 yards north of the house now. It gets dark. Curiosity gets the best of him. He goes into the house and has a conversation with his father. How do we know this? It's in a book, Battle and Battlefields, written by one of the early historians, a W.C. Stork. He was a young man who was a, uh, from Gettysburg, who arrived at the time of the battle, uh, became uh, a prominent guide, was the president of the guides. Uh, but even more importantly, his older sister married Henry Wentz's nephew. So he had direct access to Wentz family oral history. And Stork writes this. On the night of the second day, after Sickles' advance line at the Wentz house had been repulsed and occupied by the forces under General Lee, Henry Wentz visited his old home and was greatly surprised to find his father still there. I wish Stork had written more about it. That's all we have. We know there was that conversation. Again, the word surreal comes up a lot. Uh, when I was doing this research, when I talked about this book. Moved to the third day, Frank Hoffman now on the field with the artillery. Frank Hoffman and, and uh, Henry Wentz are both part of the great cannonade before Pickett's charge. They're firing at Union positions. There is a story about uh, Confederate artillery fire that day. It wouldn't come from one of those guns, probably AP Hill's guns, but there was a shell that hit a tombstone in Evergreen Cemetery. Tombstone remains up. The damage is still very visible. It's marked there. You can go visit it. There's the tombstone. Tombstone of Wesley Culp's father. That's the tombstone of Osias J. Culp, hit by the Federal Artillery Fire uh, a day after his son was killed. And it's a, yeah, a testament to the action that, that, that happened there. So wonder there's not more damage, but that's, a, that's kind of a living testament to what, to what happened there at Gettysburg. Obviously, we know Pickett's charge, what happens. The Confederates charge with 12,500 men. There, uh, uh, there was a bloody repulse. The battle ends. The four surviving members of the Gettysburg Rebels served through the remainder of the war. They all were taken prisoner. Henry Wentz just a couple of days before Appomattox. They all signed oaths of allegiance. Here's Robert Hoffman's oath of allegiance. And you see his signature. Notice that it was at Harper's Ferry. History plays tricks. 1859, Robert goes to Harper's Ferry for the John Brown Raid. 1861, Robert goes to Harper's Ferry to join the Confederate Army. 1865, he's back in Harper's Ferry signing his oath of allegiance to regain his citizenship. To the United States. Only have one incident that I could find of any of these guys coming back to Gettysburg after the battle. Henry Wentz was back in 1872 after his parents had died. He came back to settle to sell the property. Deed records: Henry and his brothers Peter and Abraham are on those on those deeds. Henry's name is listed first. I'm assuming he took he took charge. That's the only evidence. He was the first to die. He died in 1875. He was a house plasterer. Couldn't have been a very healthy uh, healthy profession to have at that point. His obituary in the Martinsburg paper identified himself as a brave Confederate soldier and, and said his father owned land on the Gettysburg battlefield. So I'm often asked, did these guys conceal their identities? Is anybody their story? No. People in their towns knew. Frank Hoffman lived the longest. He lived till 1920. Uh, he was in Washington, D.C. at the time. His obituary in the Washington Times is headlined, PA man who fought for the Confederacy. Talk about being from a prominent family. And, South Central Pennsylvania. So the stories were known at the time, they just kind of been buried over time. Frank had a daughter who lived until 1972. That's only 46 years ago, folks. So in my lifetime, in some of your lifetime, somebody who knew one of these guys intimately was still alive. How I wish she had written something. But again, like Henry once never married, no children, no direct descendants, we don't have anything. That's it. So, that's the story of these men I call the Gettysburg Rebels. They were on the losing side of the battle. They certainly were on the wrong side of history, fighting for an army and a government that was looking to extend slavery. But they were participants in and unique witnesses to one of the great and impactful and cataclysmic events in American history. Uh, and on top of that, they were <coughs> surreal nature, foreign invaders in their own hometown. And I just thought that story deserved it. Thank you very much for joining me.